use physical forms in pity and killing. Salute to the fam. Salute to the fam. How you feeling? How you feeling? I'll be going to this history of the menstrual show real quick, real quick. Let's see. and prepare an actual lesson for you. So I'm excited to be able to do this today. We're going to talk about the menstrual show, a menstrual in American history. So my goal in this very brief lesson, I'm gonna give you just a very brief overview of the menstrual show, but you should, here's my objective, you should be able to explain how the menstrual show affected how America treated slaves, then freedmen, then African-Americans throughout history. Again, you should be able to explain how the menstrual show affected the way America treated slaves, Freedmen and African Americans. So there it is. So let's begin. So the minstrel show was a form of entertainment, and it was a it was a series of, of traveling shows across the United States. Um, based on, on the research, most sources cited around 1830 is when the menstrual shows began and they really, really popped in, in popularity uh, between about 1850 and 1870. That was the height of the popularity for those shows. And these shows feature primarily white actors and their role in these shows was to mock black people by playing up on the, the different stereotypes and prejudices at the time. And what these white actors did in order to really get in character was they would uh, they would darken their face by either using uh, uh, making a, a paste out of burnt cork uh, using a grease paint or they would use shoe polish to darken their face. And we know this today as black face. And for a person to do this to their face today is socially unacceptable because of the history of the minstrel show. So I want to make this as real as possible for you. That's one of the things that I love about being a history teacher is my challenge is to take you back in time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some actual newspapers and we're going to look at some of the things that they were saying back then about the menstrual shows. So this first one is from July of 1931, actually July 3rd of 1931. And this is a little article. It's a review of a menstrual show that came through uh, this particular town and the Headline, as you can see here, is free menstrual show like manna out of heaven. Now, I want you to think about the time. Think about what's happening in the country. And if you really think about the context here, that may give you a clue as to why this show is seen as manna from heaven. Them, but I'm just leave that out there and I'm not going to lead you, but I want you to think about that yourself. So let's get into one of these paragraphs a little bit with 
Everyone loves a menstrual show, it says, and the audience is always composed of children. Whether they be six or 60, the catchy songs, melodies of the Southland up-to-date tunes, the funny jokes by the end mend, the quips and rags by the comedians, and last but not least, the numbers by the entire company are events that everyone is fond of and remembers. So obviously these people had a wonderful time taking in this menstrual show. Now check this out. Here's an, here's another clue. Here, here's another clue with this, with this paragraph. It says with many out of work. Hmm. Interesting. Why would many people be out of work? The show is a delightful relief, especially when the cost of living of some cannot include pay. This is, this is really happened. A lot of people are unaware of this history and are, are, are unaware of just how widely accepted that the, these things were. And so that's. That's why we're digging into these primary sources to see how people live, how people accepted and viewed these menstrual shows. Let's continue. So this one is interesting. That's, that's why we're digging into these primary sources to see how people live, how people accepted and, and viewed these menstrual shows. Let's continue. So this one is interesting. This is a, a page out of a newspaper and the page is filled with advertisements for this particular show, the all stars, minstrels, burnt cork and variety show. So it looks like this show is going to be, this show is going to be coming to town on a Friday and notice they're going to be playing at a local high school. And all throughout this page, you'll see advertisements, people advertising their businesses and, and their services while using these images of these menstrual performers. And these businesses had to be very strategic and smart about what images they put along with their advertisements. So it's interesting that these businesses here, they all believe that this image of this menstrual would encourage people to purchase the products and services. So here's another one that I found very interesting. So we have another particular show and 
on this page there are also other businesses using the show to encourage people to purchase their products or, or visit their business. And you may have heard of this company that is using the menstrual show to increase revenue. They are the JC Penny company and they say, I'm going to trade there and then I can afford to take my gal to the Elks menstrual show. But the other thing that I saw on this page was just really interesting. And I, I want to read this in its entirety because it aligns with my objective for this video. Again, how do these menstrual shows affect how America treated first the slaves, then freedmen, then African-American? How did these menstrual shows affect how they were treated? So check this out. This is the Elks Creed. Now the Elks, those, those are the, the people who are putting on this particular show, menstrual show. There are, there are many different groups out there who are putting on these shows throughout the country. It reads, I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed. A democracy and a republic, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states, a perfect union, one and inseparable, established upon those principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity for which American patriots sacrifice their lives and fortunes. I therefore believe it is my duty to my country to love it, to support its constitution, to obey its laws, to respect its flag, and to defend against all enemies. This is the, the Elks American Creed. Now here's another one that I found from 1921 and it's very, very interesting. This is from High Point, North Carolina. And basically this organization that was putting on this menstrual show that was putting on this menstrual show, they, they were actually going to cancel uh, a menstrual show performance and the local citizens were so upset. And remember, they, they had sold tickets for this particular show and the citizens, they, they became came so upset that they threatened violence. So as I said before, the menstrual show is it's a traveling show that appeared in city to city and there were also uh, reoccurring characters now one of these reoccurring characters was a character named jim crow now that name should sound familiar because that was a name given to the laws that separated white people from black people in the united states i want to share with you some of the lyrics of a song titled jump jim crow Come listen, all you gals and boys. I's just from Tucky Ho. I'm going to sing a song, a little song. My name's Jim Crow. Fist on the heel tap, then on the toe. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. And every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. So as you were looking at those lyrics on the screen, that should give you an idea of the, the, the spirit of these shows. The, these shows are not, um, they're, they're not endearing. They're not respectful. They're, they're made to mock black people. 
and you can imagine when the, the, the kid, I mean, this is a form of entertainment. So the actor has really got to, they've got to really play it up and, and, and get into it. And this particular song was very, very popular. And the actor who portrayed this character earned a lot of money doing so. And lastly, I want to leave you with these compelling pictures. These pictures are, they have some awesome clarity and they are from 1938. And they were taken in my home state of Missouri, Sykeston, Missouri, to be a little more specific. So remember I mentioned that they, these are traveling shows. Here you see the workers there. They're setting up the tents where the performances are going to take place. And as we're going through these pictures, what you'll also notice is you'll also notice some African-Americans helping out with the work. Now, definitely they're not co-signing what's going to be happening underneath this tent, but they are very happy to be working because there's something going on at this time. So we'll stop right there. Um, that is a, it's a very sensitive subject, but I think it, it's, it's one that, you know, we need to discuss because there are many of many people out there who simply is Crash Course Theater, and today we're continuing our discussion of 19th century American theater with a look at some upsetting parts of our theatrical past. In the 19th century, race and racism contributed to a unique and troubling performance culture, which helped create and spread racist stereotypes that are still with us today. And just to be super clear, the stuff we're talking about in this episode is tough. The images are upsetting, and much of the language is fraught to put it lightly. So just an upfront content warning so you know what's coming up. While some theatrical versions of Uncle Tom's Cabin contributed to the abolitionist cause, other melodramas used racial themes to titillate white audiences and even to support slavery's values. America's original theatrical form, the minstrel show, reinforced ugly caricatures even as it made some African-American performers stars. We're also going to look at the history of African-American theater, which is a tradition as old 
as America. Before we get into all the disturbing details about minstrel shows, we should take a moment to note that there's a vital tradition of African-American theater actually made by African-Americans that's almost as old as America itself. In 1816, William Alexander Brown, a former ship steward turned theatrical impresario, opened the African Grove Theater in New York. The theater's resident company, the African Company, was all black. They played to mostly black audiences with a Shakespeare repertory. Richard III and Othello were particularly popular. Brown also wrote original plays. The drama of King Shadoway was performed at the Grove in 1823. This play about a revolt against British colonists on the island of St. Vincent was probably the first play by an African American performed in the US. Sadly, it has been lost. Unsurprisingly, the African Grove Theater faced hostility. On at least one occasion, rowdy white spectators hired by a rival theater caused trouble, yelling during performances and threatening to riot. Other times, neighbors objected to the noise at the theater, complaining that the conduct of the patrons was unacceptably boisterous. The theater was shuttered in 1823. One young actor who got his start at the African Grove was Ira Aldridge. Faced with bigotry and a lack of available roles, he left New York as a young man, sailing for England. And there, he became a widely celebrated performer of classical roles, playing Othello and the rebel slave Orinoco. Sometimes he also acted in whiteface, playing Sherlock, Richard III, and King Lear. He toured Europe and was especially popular in Russia and Prussia. The first published play we have by an African-American author is by William Wells Brown, a leading abolitionist thinker and lecturer. Brown was an escaped slave, and his 1858 play The Escape is partly autobiographical. In it, two slaves, Melinda and Glenn, who have different masters, marry in secret. Each is horribly mistreated, and together they plan a daring escape to Canada. But Wells Brown's characters are escaping from the American 19th century theater, too. The play shakes off 19th century theatrical tropes and racist stereotypes. Wells Brown transforms minstrel songs, which we'll discuss very soon, into hymns of freedom. The ideas behind the escape, that African Americans are fully human, that they resent their masters, and also that the dominant genres of 19th century American theater were complicit in racist ideology, were incendiary enough that the escape wasn't ever performed in Brown's lifetime. He did read it himself at abolitionist rallies, though, which must have been amazing, giving an African American voice and perspective to a theatrical moment featuring almost entirely white performers and playwrights. Sadly, nuanced or thoughtful portrayals of African Americans were far from the norm. African Americans were largely subjects of caricature, comedy, and racism in American theater. The Minstrel Show was a widely popular and deeply racist 19th century genre created by white Americans. It allowed other white Americans to laugh at stereotyped portrayals of African Americans. Initially, it was performed by white actors in blackface, a kind of theatrical makeup that used burnt cork, grease paint, and even shoe polish to darken the skin, and other makeup to exaggerate the eyes and lips. Later on, when African Americans began to perform in minstrel shows, they had to use blackface too, transforming themselves into the caricatures that white audiences demanded. The genre is usually credited to T.D. Rice, or Daddy Rice, a New York actor who sang and danced in blackface in variety entertainments. He styled himself as an Ethiopian delineator, created a character named Jim Crow, and popularized the song Jump Jim Crow, in the late 19th century, racist laws enforcing segregation in the southern United States became known as Jim Crow laws after Daddy Rice's character. Rice wasn't the first white man to use blackface in America. Blackface servant characters had appeared on U.S. stages since the 18th century, and let's not forget Othello. But Daddy Rice was the first to become famous for it, even taking his act to London. He later became even more famous for playing Uncle Tom in a pro-slavery version of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which we'll discuss in a minute. For a while, there was a statue of him in blackface on Broadway. 
Performers such as Al Jolson performed on Broadway in blackface well into the 20th century. Initially, performances like Rice's were solo acts. But in the 1840s, minstrelsy formalized and became a team effort. In the first act, the troupe would gather on stage in a semicircle with a figure named Tambo, who played the tambourine on one end, Bones, who played the bone castanets on the other, and an interlocutor in the middle. They would tell jokes and sing songs, some of which were originals, some derived from folk songs. We still have some of these songs today, like Oh Susanna, though the lyrics have been adjusted. The second act, the Olio, was devoted to variety entertainment, and usually included a nonsense speech delivered in dialect. The third act, or afterpiece, was a burlesque of a popular play or scene depicting idealized plantation life. Performers began to specialize in certain character types, such as the Mammy, the Buck, the Zip Coon, the Jezebel, and the Pickaninny. Some of the shows were grotesque and profane, others were sanitized. Some shows even tried to unite blacks and white working class audiences as mutual victims of oppression. But as the Civil War approached, most shows encouraged white animosity and presented happy visions of plantation life. Minstrel shows promoted a racist image of African Americans as childish, dim, and lazy. This continued even as African Americans began to perform them and were expected to conform to the expectations of white audiences. But these African-American minstrel shows also introduced new songs and characters and eventually led to African-American musical plays. Though minstrel shows waned in popularity in the late 19th century and early 20th, the minstrel tradition continued in literature, on Broadway, in silent film, in not-so-silent film, on the radio, in cartoons, and even on early television shows. Melodrama was big everywhere, but only America decided to link melodrama and the minstrel show. And this gets us Uncle Tom's Cabin, stage adaptations of Harriet Beecher Stowe's abolitionist novel with frank discussions about the horrors and complexities of slavery, and which depicts slaves, shockingly at the time, as people with relationships and emotions. Also, yes, adaptations, plural. The novel, serialized in 1852,
reinforce certain ideas about black people and white people. Some of the best discussions we have in the museum are about the word nigga, which sounds kind of weird, by the way, because I'm a sociologist and we don't believe words have any inherent meaning. They're just sound science that we give. But we do believe that people, once the meanings are given, that they are shared. I mean, no piece is inherently racist. It's a racist society which will create racist objects and will racialize other objects. That's why the watermelon is, is, it has a race of, there's nothing inherent about a watermelon that makes us racist. But you know darn well that it's been racialized. Someone looking at uh, Aunt Chimama objects or other mammy images, they don't think of that as offensive. They think of good times spent with the family. Families, it's very nostalgic. Someone else looking at those same pieces, they see the vestiges of slavery and segregation. So often we're not deciding that something is racist, but what we are doing are collecting pieces that help us. Families, it's very nostalgic. Someone else looking at those same pieces, they see the vestiges of slavery and segregation. So often we're not deciding that something is racist, but what we are doing are collecting pieces that help us talk about racism. We have lots of friends of the museum and we receive hundreds of pieces a year. The first director of the museum he said to me one day, hey, there's, there's a couple guys I want you to meet. Here we go. Here's some Jim Crow related materials. These are the, some of them are older, some are newer. These are like 1950s. This is Male cute. and female. Yeah, those, those are really interesting. They are. Our group of friends, friends were all collecting this because we realized what it said about our society and what it said about where we were in the past and where maybe we still were. When we met David Pilgrim in the, the whole Jim Crow Museum and all of that, it was like, uh, finally, there's a place where we can put this. A sense work. of relief that we could let go yeah, of these yeah. objects so that people could learn from it. We have some understanding of, of bigotry. We have some understanding of uh, being the outsider or not being accepted or being told that we are not welcomed, we can't be accepted. You, you have no place here. I think because we've experienced that in our own lives, because we're gay, uh, there's a little transference there to trying I had to pause the video on that one. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <sighs> Let me see if I can uh, fast forward.
intellectual pride and integrity to want to preserve them. <clears throat> and I think a racist is one that doesn't care enough for his race or another race to where they would, don't care whether they're amalgamated or destroyed or not. Then, could I ask the governor a sure. question? Yeah. Uh, are you familiar, uh, familiar with the black Muslims in this country? Not too familiar with them, though. No. Well, they practice uh, black separatism. Well, that's free, and I'm not familiar with them. <laughs> good answer. Very good answer. That's what I say. <laughs> but uh, to continue along that line, do you feel that uh, what they're doing uh, is right? You know, they believe that uh, white people uh, should be separate. They believe that they should have a state in this country. I think they uh, felt that Mississippi or Georgia should be. You know, one of those two states should be the state. Do you well, feel I was, like th this I was is thinking maybe they ought to make it New York. New York, you think so? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get over that, Governor. You look too tough. <clears throat> no, I, I think uh, I think that forced racial segregation is criminal and unconstitutional, and I think forced racial integration is criminal and unconstitutional. I think mm -hmm. either one of them is, is cruel. You mean on social? Force. You mean on social level? Any level, if. It, Boy, it's forced. <clears throat> well, you, we do have, like, uh, the laws. You mean when the laws are enforced, that if it involves uh, integration, then it is wrong? If it forces people against their will, against denying them their choice, to then you separate mean or to be, integrate, there should be an it'd be just as wrong if, it, if the law would be just as wrong to, to force them to integrate as it would to be to force them to segregate. Well, don't you if a country can finally get to the point of saying, well, you're going to hire this person, you're going to promote this person, you're going to serve this person, or you, then the country, <clears throat> same country can come right around and tell you, going, you've got to work for that person, you've got to eat with that person, you've got to be served by that person. And this would be cruel and wrong, but so it is when it tells another person that you've got to do this. Well, the laws of the land tells us all what we have to do, basically. That doesn't make it right. Well, I agree with that, but I mean, don't you I mean, believe... Don't the you Supreme believe, Court goes outside the Constitution. <clears throat> that doesn't make the Supreme Court right, does it? Don't you believe to have an affluent society, we've all, like, uh, chose to live in a society together, don't you believe that to preserve that society that we need laws, laws of the land, that's why we have a society, and uh, we cannot make exception to these laws just because a person happens to be black or white, don't you we've believe We've got that? most of these laws because <clears throat> we don't abide by the laws of God, though. And so we, we, try to, we try to go against the laws of God and against the laws of nature, and we say, well, nah, you're, you're inferior, and you're not going to be able to meet with success in education or in your social life, even in your religious life, life unless you do it with another race. And this teaches inferiority to me. As and it's wrong and it's criminal and it's cruel to teach any one person that he <laughs> is inferior to another race or his race is inferior. But as governor of uh, the state of Georgia, did you go by the laws of God or by the laws of the state? I go by the laws of God and by the laws of the state. As you see fit. What, what is... Uh... <laughs> no, it's not about it. <clears throat> I just want to ask the governor... Uh, when, when you say it's, uh, it's morally wrong, um, I integration, I believe that's what you said. Or, or it's I said it's forced God. segregation or forced integration, <clears throat> racial integration uh. or forced seg uh, racial segregation. They're both morally wrong cruel, and in violation of the United States Constitution, which is the law of the land, not the Supreme Court ruling that yeah. denies the Constitution. You know, I, I assume you know Dr. Billy Graham. <clears throat> sir? I, 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 you know Dr. Billy yes, Graham? Yes, sir. He was here last night, and he, he said that racial prejudice is also morally wrong. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh, yes, sir. I think uh, racial prejudice is wrong. Yes, sir. No. <laughs> we have more... We, we, our Are you too old for grinding? Can't be bothered with looking for the perfect bill. We, we have more, we, we, our government's probably practicing more prejudice today than ever practiced in all the land so mm -hmm. far as between the black and whites. Mm -hmm. There was a quote uh, that you made on the fight uh, in Miami that Muhammad Ali participated in with Jerry Quarry. And, uh, well, not in Miami, but in, in Atlanta. 
But uh, black people always felt that Atlanta was the model city of the South because of its integration and because of the participation in uh, uh, economics of black people. And uh, your statement uh, on the day of the fight was something like this, that it's a dark day in Georgia because this fight is being put on. Now, uh, the law of the land said that a man can participate uh, in his profession unless he is in jail. Uh, I felt very happy that this fight took place in Atlanta. How did, how did you feel about I it? I felt very sad. And why was that? Here's a man that, uh, that has <clears throat> said, well, here I want to fight in the ring for money, but I won't even wear the uniform of my country. He says that I, I can't do this, but it, it, and, and in other words, I'm going to act di different from these other people who stand up for their country and put on the uniform. Uh, it, had they not fought for this country, if they were not even fighting today and wearing this uniform, that he could not even get in a ring and fight and be a free man to but fight. But isn't it true? So he, he's, he's helping to bring, tear down this country with this philosophy, with this belief. Suppose every American, Mr. Brown, suppose every American had decided that they were not going to put on the uniform of their country and not fight for it. We, we, would, we, wouldn't have a United, we wouldn't have a United States of America, and I couldn't be on your show, and you probably wouldn't even have a show Isn't tonight it true? if Isn't everybody had had that attitude. And I don't like it, and I don't care whether you like it, don't care who don't like it. Well, I, uh, I, uh, I, did serve, I did serve my time, which, of course, I was a little before Muhammad Ali, and I was not maybe as intelligent as he is, because he was the first individual, I think, in this country that came out and said he had nothing against the Viet Cong. I think there were two other politicians in the country that made a very similar statement later. Uh, the late Bobby Kennedy came back from Vietnam and basically said the same thing. At the time, it was not a popular stand to make, but today it is a very popular stand. In fact, we have a lieutenant that's on trial now for certain uh, things that happened in Vietnam. But I am saying that this man followed the law of the land. He made his stand, he has been fighting through the courts, he has gone to the higher courts, and he will go to jail if he is proven guilty. Well, I hope now, he does feel, go, I, I hope, because I think he's guilty Can of treason. Can I finish? Can I finish? Don't you feel that whenever a man goes through the courts, that he is abiding by the laws of the land, and that man who is willing to stand up with that decision is a brave man, regardless of what his beliefs might be? I know a lot of Southerners who, uh, you know, really like black people. And, uh, you know, they portray themselves as uh, being really segregationists and that they hate black people and so forth. But uh, I know some black people feel the same way, but I don't know. I don't know any Southerners that don't like uh, white Southerners don't like blacks. Do you know of any? Can you name uh, one? I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. That's a very interesting I mean, can point. you name one? No, I'm, I'm going to answer that question. It's an interesting point. You it see. is, yeah. Well, they like uh, uh, black people, but they like them in a role, you see. They like them when they're very humble. And they're very loyal. Well, I like humble people, whether they're white I, or black, I don't know, you? I know, but you see... And loyal people, whether they're black the, or white, the, the don't white you? I mean, you just choice. like them. You they don't like the them lo loyal You don't like the black people to have the choice, you see. It's only a matter of choice. I want black people and white <clears throat> people to have choice. Well, you let you me got ask it you, all mixed up. You're let, trying to twist it around. No, no, I'm only huh? trying to agree with you. Would you let me finish? If you'll tell the truth. Well, I'm only making an analysis, really. It's not a matter of truth or false. Uh, what I'm really saying is that basically history has proven that uh, during the days of slavery, whenever a slave was more or less humble and he did what he was told, that he was in good favor with, with the master. But whenever a slave was too educated, uh, if he became aware of his own self and he wanted to become more than the master wanted him to become, then he was a bad slave. He was then put down because he represented a threat to the already established kind of white look, society. Look, look, let me say this. Those situations are true <clears throat> with white people and black people. Now, you're just trying to point it at black people only. Because but they've been true throughout uh, the, the history of the we're world. About. There's been discrimination, black against black, black against white, white against black, and white against white. There always has been, there always will be. You're and not you're not going to wipe it out, and Tricky Dick's not going to wipe it out, and the Supreme Court's not going to wipe it out. <laughs> you're not addressing it. <laughs> you're not addressing it. Are you too old for grinding? Can't be bothered with looking for the perfect build online. Or simply have a life. Get the best builds.
You're not addressing uh, Are you your referring answer to, to me my as question. Tricky Dick? No, you know, you know who I'm talking about. Oh, you are. Oh. Well, you know something, Governor? Believe it or not, I don't think that integration should be the number one thrust of uh, uh, our civil rights leaders anyway because I think what we're really talking about in this country is economic development of black people because I've found economic that... Economic development of all people. Well, we're talking about well, How come you have people. black people? How we're come you don't want to do it for well, black I'll, people? How come I'll, you don't want to do it for you, white people? I'll tell you why. Huh? I'll tell you why. How come you don't want to do it for everybody? How come you always can black get, people? Can Why don't I you talk about all people? Can I give you an answer? Huh? I think can we I understand give, the please. question. Can I give you an answer? Do you mind? Oh, go ahead. If you're ready, I'll give you time. Okay, go uh, what I'm really saying is that there are some people that have suffered in this country, poor people generally, but let's say that uh, we have various ethnic groups in this country that have attained a certain kind of equality. Black people are more or less, along with the Indians, uh, on the last oh. rung of the ladder. Can I finish, Governor? Boy. Can I finish? <laughs> Can I finish? Okay, do you mind? Governor now, what I'm really boy, saying is that I feel that the way to bring about equality of black people in this system is what through economic... What about equality of white people? Now, I won't interrupt you every time you keep calling black people. Well, what about you, equality of all people? If you interrupt me, Governor, I can't talk to you. Well, I'm gonna, if you're just going to talk mm. about black people, don't include all people. I try to include all people. You don't, you don't, you're just interested in the black. Why don't you tell these people that in, in Atlanta, Georgia, where you keep talking about the South, that percentage-wise, more black people are professional business people, industrial Governor, leaders, can I, can more I, men in our state house I, elected I, officials than any other state you? in the country. Can I interrupt you? Can I interrupt Be you? all right, sir. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. See, I'm not, not really here to uh, fight with you. I'm only trying to have a discussion with you. I'm not going to fight and with trying, you either. And I'm trying I... to use the technique. <laughs> there's, a lot of people out there, there's a lot of people out there watching you, and I want you to be fair about all people, well, not just black people. We got a lot of people in this country. I can understand that, but you do know I have a reputation, right? And I saw you. I saw you. I saw you. Tell me what your reputation is. I saw you bring that state trooper back there, you know, behind the curtain. I know you brought him back there for a reason. But, uh, now, here you go, trying to. That is not you, my purpose well, you let tonight. me tell you this. Yeah. Well, would you like to join this conversation? Uh, no, I'm going to say this. <laughs> would you like to join this conversation? I would like. Why? Let, 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 let me say this. Let's, let's Would you let Dick talk a little? No, I've got to say this. No, I'm not going to let him talk. See, right before, now, I got on this group, before I got on this group, because I got a state trooper talk, like all the other governors in the country carry one, and the, and they require it in the state governments that the governors have security personnel. You didn't get them because so you were So I carry one right? of them. I didn't even know you would be here. All it right. was a surprise when I came here tonight and found you would be here. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I've never traveled anywhere in the United States since I've been governor. No other governors travel without one security personnel. Some of them have three and four. I carry one man as an aide, not as security. Governor oh, Mattis, could I... Are you afraid because I came up here with an aide? <laughs>